I took that almost directly from a reading that I had uh, read some time ago, and then I happened to hear an audio version. Many of you are familiar with uh, Chuck Swindoll, Insight for Living, as a great radio program, and he's just uh, humorous and very factual, and I always appreciate listening to him. And Chuck Swindoll was sharing actually a true life story from his life. And um, he said that he and his wife were vacationing in beautiful Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. Anybody ever been there before? I never have. I've seen pictures. But an incredibly beautiful place. Um, he described the sapphire blue waters that you can see um, just clear to the bottom of the ocean. You have no idea how deep it is. It's just so clear. And looking at the sky, that's the same, even more sapphire blue than what the ocean is. He said, it's just an incredibly beautiful place. And he said, all around when you get to Puerto Vallarta on the shores, on the beach, that you uh, find purveyors of the most common activity in Puerto Vallarta. What would that be? Who would know? Julie, you just came from an island. What were they doing there? Do you know? Fishing. No, not, not, not in this one. Parasailing. Everywhere there's boats on docks and you can pay your um, fee and you can go parasailing. One of those things, you know, 10-minute lesson and you're going, right? And so the idea is that they hook this. This is a real simplified version, I'm sure, because moi has never done it and probably never will. Um, but they hook a real, a real heavy cable to a boat and then they put the parasail, gizmo, on that. And in between, they strap a willing or unwilling individual. Evidently willing, because I'm sure it's not inexpensive. And when they give the signal, they put the hammer down on the boat, and there's a jerk, and up in the air you go. And you fly around for a number of minutes. And so Chuck Swindoll is describing this experience. He said, it's kind of like... When you fly a kite and you think, oh, I wish just once I had the freedom of flying like a kite does or like a bird does, it's so quiet. You can see everything from a different perspective. He said once he got past the initial terror, when he got jerked up in the air and going, he said that it was just amazing. Now, our own Roberta knows the feeling. I've got some pictures for you here. In case those of you that hadn't seen them didn't think it was for real, of course, in the upper right is the airplane in the background, so you have no doubt. And then the lower left, she's... Are you enjoying the trip there? You got your head leaned back, yeah. To be honest with you, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shoot. But it's an item that Roberta had had on her bucket list for a long time, to go skydiving, and why not? When she was in Florida this winter, she did it. Her fear was overcome by her desire to do this activity, just like Chuck Swindoll's was with the parasailing. He said, I looked it over for a while and thought of all the things that could go wrong, and then I thought, but if I don't, this is my one chance to take that chance and do it. And as Roberta expressed, there's a little video that goes with it that was a little long to show in the service, but over and over she described it as awesome, an awesome experience. Same thing that Chuck said when he talked about his parasailing. Well, some people would look at Roberta falling out of a perfectly good airplane or, uh, or Chuck Swindoll going up behind a boat on a parasail, and they would say, that just doesn't make sense. Why would anybody do that? But often in our life, the things that we're called to do don't make sense, do they? Think about it. We've, got, we've all got experiences where you think it didn't make sense or it doesn't make sense. And if it's in the past tense, most often down the road, it's like it didn't make sense at the time, but it does now. But it does now. Our scripture today goes into a little bit of an area where it might not have made sense to a lot of people. I invite you to open your Bible and turn to the book of Mark. 
and we're going to go 6b, which might not be labeled b in your Bible, but it starts about halfway through verse 6, and it goes through verse 13, Mark 6, 6b through 13. And it's titled, Jesus Sends Out the Twelve. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. Calling the twelve to him, he began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but don't wear an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and they preached that people should repent. And they drove out many demons and anointed many sick, pe sick people with oil and healed them. This is the word of God for the people of God. The disciples had been traveling with Jesus for a long time at this point. And they had pulled up roots to follow along with him. Remember the stories in the gospel where he would just wander up to an individual, the tax collector, or the fisherman, whoever it was, and say, follow me. And we don't see anything in scripture that tells us that anyone argued. It was like, okay. They left their home, they left their family, they left their occupation and took whatever they could carry in a small sack or on their back and they left and they followed Jesus. They believed with little to no question that this was what they were meant to do. Convinced to the core of their soul that this is what they were meant to do. Well, just before they received these instructions from our scripture today from Jesus, that time of going out two by two into the surrounding cities and territories, going into places that were nearly uncharted and unknown, just go, Jesus said, and drive out impure um, spirits, they had been with Jesus in his hometown to witness him teaching and preaching to his own people, the ones that knew him best, the ones that watched him grow up, the ones that you always think you go home again and they'll love me regardless. But what happened? Things didn't go as planned in his hometown. Instead, the local folks began to judge Jesus, and they began to pick him apart. Well, he's only the son of Joseph, who's a carpenter. So what? And his sisters are of little importance to this community. So who cares in the bigger picture? Jesus found himself in his own hometown, judged and rejected by the very people who knew him and should love him the most. So scripture tells us that he healed a few, a very few, and then he left, but he was discouraged. And in fact, per scripture, he was amazed by the lack of faith there in his hometown. But in spite of this experience leading into the next chapter where Jesus says, go out two by two, don't take anything with you, and teach and preach the gospel and heal, help people to repent. And the disciples said, okay, whatever you say, Jesus, we're going to go. They followed his instructions to go out and do exactly that. But he warned them, and did you pick that up in scripture? Don't stay where you're not wanted. Don't stay where you're not welcome. Some scriptures say, knock the dust off your sandals and go. You know, when you're tromping through the desert in flat pieces of leather with some 
insignificant straps just to protect your feet from the heat of the sand. Dirty feet are the order of the day, and your shoes are filled with sand multiple times per day. And Jesus said, don't hang out for it. If they don't want you there, dust off your feet, dust off your sandals, head on down the road because you're going to find somewhere who does want to hear the word of God. And as I was doing my research, I love the way the Message Bible put that passage. I want to share that with you because it puts it in a little different light. And I love the way that it says it. So bear with me as I share this with you. Jesus called the twelve to him and sent them out in pairs. He gave them authority and power to deal with the evil opposition. He sent them off with these instructions. Don't think you need a lot of extra equipment for this. You are the equipment. No special appeals for funds. Keep it simple. And no luxury ends. Get a modest place and be content there until you're leaving. If you're not welcomed, not listened to, just quietly withdraw. Don't make a scene. Shrug your shoulders and be on your way. Then they were on the road. They preached with joyful urgency, remember that, joyful urgency, that life can be radically different. Right and left, they sent the demons packing. They brought the wellness to the sick, anointing their bodies and healing their spirits. joyful urgency that just hit me like a bullet when i read it isn't that the way that we should be presenting our faith to other people if we're going around all the time what are you gonna do sunday i'm going to church sunday morning what are you gonna do thursday night oh i'm gonna go to bible study I don't know what good any of it's doing, but, you know, I'm going to go anyway because it's what I do. Who wants any of that? We should be speaking to others, and our face should reflect a joyful urgency for what we know that they may not know. Because, listen, a lot of us know, and there's a lot of others who don't. Be deeply rooted to Christ, but when he tells you to sprout wings and fly, then my friends, go do it. Don't hesitate. Don't wonder what you ought to take. Don't pack and repack and think it over and pack again. Just go. Isn't this the way we should present ourselves to others willing to follow Christ at any cost for any reason when he calls and says go? Joyful urgency. I can't wait to go. I've got to get it together. I've got to do it now. But life gets in the way. And we can talk ourselves out of the God things quicker than what he can show up and say, do this or do that and follow me. And suddenly following him becomes a chore instead of this joyful urgency to do what it is that he's directing you to do. And it shows on our faces and in our actions. Chuck Swindoll got to talking about those moments of parasailing. He said it was only just a few minutes, six or eight minutes total. And he said he got a whole new vision of this beautiful world that we live in. That it was clear and clean and fresh and carefree because, hey, what was he going to do about it? He didn't have control of anything. Just enjoy the ride. For those few moments, he said he realized that nothing else mattered. Nothing got in the way. Nothing cluttered his mind. He called it a case of unencumbered freedom. Completely removed from the expectations of others. 
but not from God. He got to enjoy God's glory and majesty of the earth in a way that many of us will never get to experience. And he realized just how vast and how wonderful God had made it, just in one little corner of the world. How often, my friends, do the expectations of others keep us from following God's will for our lives? How often does that happen? Young people graduate and they have dreams of traveling, but they're told that's silly or it's not safe to go there or it's too far from home. You need to stay here where you can be close to family and help. We mature and we feel moved to have a major career change or decide to physically move a distance away. But we find all kinds of reasons not to change, not to go. Well, I've never done that before. Or it's never been done in our family that way before. All kinds of reasons and excuses. How often in our lives day after day after day goes by and we feel a calling to spend more time with God and listen and follow what it is he's telling us to do. You see, I'm, I'm convinced God did not give us this life to be looking back over our shoulder and say, if only, shoulda, coulda, woulda, right? Right? He wants us to have deep roots in him and then the confidence that when he is thoroughly with us and we know that, we can sprout wings and fly in the direction that he's taking us. Remember when Jesus took his disciples apart from the others, from the crowds, to rest for a while? They were beat. They were done in. They had walked and walked and walked. They had ministered, they had healed, they had preached, they had taught, they had been mocked. It was a hard, hard road. And Jesus recognized that not only the disciples, but he needed a rest. And he took them a while, took them uh, apart to rest for a while. And what did they do while they were resting? They listened, they learned, and they obeyed. They deserve time away from the everyday grind, just like all of us do, and Jesus provided that venue for them. Folks, life is full of rejection, amen? And life is full of frustration, bigger amen? Amen. But we aren't to get caught up in all that as Christians, We can't get caught up in all that. If you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then you should have your sights beyond any of these earthly issues because there's something so much better waiting for us out there. Swindoll talked about the moment that he hit altitude in his parasailing experience. And he said, there was nothing more to do except to enjoy the view. He said, he got an amazing look at Earth's canvas before, all those tiny little boats that were actually yachts in the harbor, but he was some 500 feet in the air. A million multicolored ants moving around on the beach, that was people. And he said although he couldn't see her, he was real certain that there was one very worried woman watching him and wondering if she was about to be a widow. Maybe, just maybe. Maybe it's time for us to step out and say, this is for my good and for God's glory even though I cannot begin to explain it. 
But for us to know God and follow God, we have to follow his word and scripture. Goes back to that little two-minute thing, challenge that I gave you a while back. It wasn't just to give you something else to do on your to-do list. That two minutes a day with scripture is so that when God calls, you'll recognize it and hear. I have people say all the time, well, God never talks to me. And I'm telling you, yes, he does. If you're in his word and if you're listening. But remember being a little kid, you had to learn to listen. We have this new little puppy at our house. <laughs> Daisy May. I should say Mike has a new little puppy because mostly she's his charge. And she's adorable. We had company come yesterday not to see us. They came to see Daisy May. <laughs> and she put on her most adorable act. She cocks her little head, you know. She comes when you call. She's only eight weeks old. She knows how to sit and stay already. Doing real good with the whole potty thing. But then in a moment, she can be the tiniest terror. What she, what she weigh 14 pounds, did you say, now? Well, it's like 114 pounds of terror. Mike said yesterday, I'm going to go take a shower. It's like having, I said, I said to him, I said, this is like having triplets. Not, you know, we had twins. We survived that. This, this is triplets. We thought about it a long time before we got a puppy and thought, no problem. And then we forgot we were 18 years older than when we last had a puppy. And Daisy Mae's just fresh and new. She's ready to rock and roll. So Mike said, I'm going to go take a shower. Will you watch the dog? Because you can't leave her for one millisecond. So she's got a dog bed in the living room, and she's got a, a dog crate in the living room, and she's got a basket just, you know, how many dogs have a longer burger basket for their toys? Well, <laughs> ours does. And it's just heaped up with toys. And in the short time it took Mike to take a shower, she had gone in the utility room and pulled out first one of his work boots, and it's one of the, these numbers because the boot's bigger than she is. Then she pulled out the other work boot, and then she went back for a tennis shoe, so I had to haul it all back in and put it away and shut the utility room door. While I was doing that, she was in her toy basket, and by the time Mike came out from his shower, he's like, did a toy bomb blow up in here? Because there were toys everywhere. And then, of course, her favorite toy is the three-legged cat. And they just go round and round and round. It's just insane. But she has an exuberance for life because nobody has crushed that for her yet. You know, I mean, she is full throttle on, got to live it all today, just like you watch little Letty or little Ashton go, they got to live it all today, right? Because they don't understand about tomorrow. And it's the same thing with little 14-pound uh, Daisy May. She wants to live it all today and go. Maybe that's the way that we need to live with that joyful exuberance. Without abandon. Now I hope that you all listen a little better than Daisy May does because we're not, we're not there yet, but we're getting there. But you have to listen when God calls you. And if you're listening you'll hear. It's kind of like, and you moms will understand, or grandmas, stepping into a nursery full of babies that are crying. If you've been in a bigger church or if you've been to a daycare center and there's a nursery full of babies and when one cries, everybody cries. But you step in and what do you hear? Your own baby, right? The one that's connected with you is the one that you hear. You recognize your own because you're familiar and you're tied into it and you love it beyond compare. We need to be tied in that same way with the voice of God, my friends. And unless we're drawing in close in relationship to him, we're not going to hear it. God gives us all wings to fly in different ways. 
I shared with you earlier about Gwen and even her voice sounds terrible, but her spirit is amazing. And to just hear that voice a little bit and hear about her headbands and a Mickey or Minnie Mouse bow on her head. Think of the joy that she's spreading to others around here. The ones that know that she's suffering, they're on the inside track, those nurses and doctors. But yet she's spreading the joy that only can come from a knowledge, a personal relationship with God. So if God's given you wings to fly, and he's given them to all of you, but all of you haven't used them. If he's given you those wings to fly, make sure that you're using those to fly closer to him each and every day. Okay? Let's pray. Father God, you do help us to sprout wings. It's up to us to use them for the good of your kingdom. Help us to have this joyful urgency to reach out to others, to tell the world. Let the world wonder what we're up to when they see us. Let our faces reflect the love that you have for us. Let us push aside all of these earthly things that distract us, that pull us aside. Because, God, there's something so much better waiting for us. It's in your promises. And we trust those promises enough to be here and to listen to your word and try to grow in that way. And so, God, if we're going to listen to the words, let us apply them to our lives. Be with us as we come to the table of Holy Communion today as we come to share in the body and the blood of Christ. We pray it in your name. Amen. There was that night in the upper room after Jesus and the disciples had traveled long, long distance. They were tired. They were more than tired. They were weary. And they had eaten. Someone had prepared a wonderful meal for them and made them some bread and put new wine out and they were as refreshed as you can get when you need a good night's sleep. And as they prepared to go recline and find somewhere to lay down, Jesus did something completely unexpected. He reached across the table and he picked up a loaf of unbroken bread. And he closed his eyes and he gave it a blessing as the disciples looked on. And then he raised it up and he asked for a blessing from his heavenly father. And then he broke that bread. And he said, this bread is a symbol of my body that will be broken for you on the cross at Calvary. So as you take and as you eat of it, I want you to do that in remembrance of me. And then likewise, he went to the cup. And the same thing, he gave a blessing. And then he raised the cup towards the heavens to his heavenly father. And he asked his heavenly father to bless it. And then he said, this cup is filled with the symbol of my blood that will be shed for you on the cross at Calvary. As you take and as you drink of it, I want you to do it in remembrance of me. I didn't ask ahead, but Sarah and Lucas, will you guys come and help serve? Be good to have Lucas back serving with us again. Here in the United Methodist Church, you don't need to be a member to come and partake of Holy Communion. We just ask that you come. Spend as much time at the altar as you would like. There's little baskets for your cups when you're done, and then you can return to your seat, and we'll uh, go until everyone has been served. So uh, Roberta will play, and we ask you to come and be served and share in the body and the blood of Christ.
And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 Let's stand together for our closing number. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. His words never fail you. He promised, believe him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying. That's what we're charged to do, my friends. But we've got to have him embedded so deeply in our hearts and our lives before we can do that. So make sure that he's given you wings and that you recognize him. Let him sprout, fly wherever they take you. Don't look back. Don't let the world hold you down. Just go. When he says go, follow. It won't make sense most of the time. Trust me, I'm a living testament to that. But you go, and you do. With that joy that only a love for Christ can give you. Father, I thank you for this beautiful day as we prepare to go out and try to catch up on a bunch of yard work that we're so far behind on. Um, but Father, we're going we're gonna to worship you in the weeds, in the plantings, in the mowing, in the sunshine. We're going to worship you and praise you. And we're going to have a smile on our face, a look on our face that makes the rest of the world wonder what we're up to because we've got something special. Us and you, this church, this church family, there are still empty seats, Lord. Help us to fill them with those that need to know your word. Until we meet again, we pray it in your precious and holy name. Amen.